Thanks very much. Okay. As I said, I have no PowerPoint today. I'm actually going to write on the board. Um, okay. So because, uh, just to review where we've been, we were at Plato and the Republic, Aristotle and his Politic, and now we're on Cicero, on the Republic. Um, the reading. Who happened to really enjoy Cicero's writing? Did any of you happen to enjoy his writing? I told you that Cicero is one of the, the better writers that we're going to read. Yeah. Okay. Um, did anything stand out to you as you were reading book one of On the Republic? I wrote down the quote. You're totally fine. I'm going to scribble stuff on the board while you're doing it. Just so that we remember. Um, it's like on the last page. But thus kings attract us by our affection for them, ours proceeds by their wisdom, and popular governments by their freedom. Beautiful. That's, that's exactly right. Because what we're going to see in Cicero, and it's lamentable how small a selection they give you of him in here. This is my first time teaching this class. No offense to Oxford University Press, I know that you watch my videos religiously, but I do not think we will take this book again. I just think you, you short us on too many things of the classics. Um, he doesn't get too much into it here, but that, that gets at one of his central ideas, which is that unlike Plato, or who, who believes that there is one ideal form of government, only one way to have a republic, which we're, we're going to get into here, and Aristotle, who believed that there were sort of proper, sound forms of government, rule by one, rule by a few, and rule by many, and then deviant forms, Cicero believed that you could have a proper Republican form of government, whether you had rule by one, rule by a few, or rule by all. And that each of them had their reasons for attracting us and being able to hold that public thing together. And so I guess I should start by emphasizing this. Before I go any further, let me just give you this critical thing here because it may have passed right by you here. The public thing, the public thing. This is what the Republic is. The Republic, res publica, the public thing. It is the state, but bigger than the state itself. It refers to the collective good of the people. So you have a concern for the common good. This is the heart of the Republic, and you can only have people who care about the common good if they are virtuous, if they are enlightened as to their own self-interest, right? And we talked about, um, and we will talk about this more, Aristotle's belief that there were some who were unable to be virtuous, and that they, therefore they were only fit to be ruled, that they had a slavish uh, mentality. This is what he's talking about here. Only those who are able to be virtuous enough to recognize through the pursuit of philosophy, as it happens, he's another one who believes that philosophy is very central to uh, education, the proper education of the, of the society. It's only through this that we will be able to see the common good and to pursue it by living virtuously. And so, would you, would you read that again? Was it you guys? Yeah. yeah. So, thus kings are characters by our affection. Okay, affection stop right there. Oh, go ahead, finish Sorry, Sorry, affection for them. Affection for them, okay. So Cicero here is saying, look, there is something very familiar in monarchy, something very natural in monarchy that attracts us so that we can live under a monarch so long as the monarch is concerned with res publica, the, the common good. A monarch, Marcus Aurelius, right? You've all heard of Marcus Aurelius, right? The great Stoic Roman emperor. He's often held up as that great, uh, you know, uh, unlimited authority who still tries to govern according to the public good, right? And for Cicero, the, the king, the king model was, was for us very natural because to him, it resembled what we most closely find in nature. That is the family structure with the king serving as the father and how it was natural for the father to have affection for his children and to only want good things from them and want to care for them, to treat them well. And remember going back to Aristotle, the, the, the family for him was the foundation of all life that that villages grew out of collections of families, right? And it was out of these kin groups and villages that you build out your, your polis, your city-state. So for him, it was a very natural way of organizing political society. Go ahead with aristocracy. Um, for aristocracies by their wisdom. 
either wisdom. Again, we talked about this. Um, for and we're, we're going to talk more about the Cicero. Very much uh, is going to aid Aristotle here, unsurprisingly, given where he studied, which was the Lyceum. He believes that aristocracy is, is really probably going to be the most sound form of government overall. He's, he's actually going to have Scipio express preference for kingship due to what we just talked about. He says, really, with the aristocracy, you have the sort of wisdom and virtue that comes from having uh, uh, lived and studied philosophy and having lived long to have acquired uh, the trappings of power that arist aristocracy requires, that is uh, land, property, right? But also, there are enough of you there that you have a collective wisdom, that you aren't, and one of his criticisms of kingship is that he's going to offer you pros and cons of kingship. Um, virtue is not hereditary, right? Just because you have a good king doesn't mean his son is going to be virtuous or wise or intelligent. And the idea being that you're sort of a, uh, it's a lottery of birth, are you gonna get a good ruler or not? Whereas with the aristocracy, you have sort of a group of, of wise, sort of potential leaders, and they can sort of curb any bad ideas and filter that stuff out. And they're going to be more likely to be more in touch with the common people because there are more of them having more experiences. A single king can only be one place at one time, tends to be a little bit cloistered, right? A little bit shut off. The aristocracy is going to be able to have more hands in more places, be more in touch with the common people without, without succumbing to sort of the, um, the mass, the impulses of the mass, the unbridled impulses of the mass. Um, which, if you read the democracy one. Um, and popular governments by their freedom. Democracy, freedom. Cicero actually says that, look, if all things were equal, and I was assured that we would get the best, only the best, because he criticizes different aspects of kingship, aristocracy, and democracy, while also providing the benefits of them, he says, look, if we're only getting the good stuff, democracy would be my choice of government. Because freedom is the ultimate human value. Liberty. Liberty is the highest human value. However, he's also going to say that, uh, you know, because liberty, uh, you know, uh, tends to lead to dissolute behavior, uh, lack of virtue, that it, uh, you know, will very easily slip into uh, either oligarchy or tyranny, as we're going to see. Because he borrows much from both Plato and Aristotle. And in terms of political uh, cycles, he, he follows Aris, uh, Plato. I'm going to write it on the board here in just a second, but if you remember, Plato had this idea of like, we're just gonna keep going around in this circle. Cicero is going to have a very similar thing going on there, except his is, is slightly different, as we'll see. Um, okay, that was, that was a great quote. That was one there that, that right at the end, I believe it's when Scipio is talking about that. Yes. Okay, anyone else? Did anyone else have any that, that stood out to them? It wasn't really a specific quote, but it kind of just reminded me of, you know, Locke's idea of a social contract. Mm -hmm. So it kind of provided a familiar, familiarity with me because he's providing the justification of monarchy to be the justification of, you know, the satisfaction of the people that uphold it in the first place. And it kind of just reminded me of like the breach of the social contract in our place when we had the revolution. But in his ideal monarchy, that would happen because there's the satisfaction, satis sorry, the satisf satisfaction of both sides that are met, so. That was interesting. It is interesting. Do you all remember signing the social contract when you were born? Sorry, I always have to do that. Yes, you're quite right. And of course, we are going to get to social contract, contract theory. We're going to study both Locke and Rousseau, who are going to have very different conceptions of the social contract and what the power uh, what, what legitimate power is and what it entitles one to do. Because of course, Locke is going to say, look, legitimate power is power that observes natural rights, which is something that Cicero is also very concerned about. Rousseau is going to be just a majoritarian. Whatever the people decide is what's going to happen. If the people decide that they want to go conquer part of lower Belgium, then dang it, that's what we're going to go do. French Revolution. Any, anyone else? Yeah. Um, okay. I just noticed this because he talks a lot about like liberty compared to like the other regimes mm -hmm. we had. Um, I saw this one. He said, "Every state is such as its ruler's character and will make it. Hence, liberty has no dwelling place in any state except that in which the people's power is the greatest. And surely nothing can be sweeter than liberty." 
but if it is not the same for all, it does not deserve the name of liberty. Yes, and there is this great tension between liberty and equality. Because Cicero also says that you, you it, within liberty, you also have to have equality among the citizens in their liberty. And so what winds up happening here, if we're not wise and virtuous and looking out for the public good, what will happen is that with their freedom, some will take an undue, uh, an unhealthy interest in acquiring material possessions, right? Another thing that he says uh, in On the Republic is beware of excess wealth. And this is something that both Plato and Aristotle are both very concerned about. And this is something that they all saw happen. They saw a, a torrent of riches coming into the new empire and corroding, erupt, eroding the, back, the, the virtue of the, lead, of the citizens, um, you know, making them indolent. They want grain doles now. They don't want to go work for it. They just want the empire to go conquer Egypt and send them back free food, right? The, 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 the aristocrats don't want to go fight in the legions anymore, don't want to send their sons to go fight in the legions anymore. They just want to go, you know, conscript a bunch of people and, and take their property and, you know, live fat off the land and, uh, you know, get drunk and be dissolute. Um, this is, this is very much a, a problem here. And wealth is going to be the great destroyer of democracy because it's going to lead back to oligarchy. Um, and I'll, I'll get to that in a minute, but it's true. He's, so he's, he's very interested in this balance because there has to be equal uh, liberty for all. But what happens is with this freedom, eventually, if we aren't wise, if we aren't looking out for the public good, eventually large disparities will, will arise and you will have some start to use the state for their own benefit, oligarchy, rather than uh, democracy. Yes. Uh, anybody else? Oligarchy. I'm going to go mob rule. I hate that you say anarchy. Mob rule. We can thank Cicero for his Latin translation of Plato's On the Republic, by the way. He spent a lot of time in Greece, wanted to bring these things back to Rome. The Romans were uh, fabulous soldiers and engineers. They were very practical, fighting people. Um, but in terms of the arts uh, and architecture, they basically just went to Greece during the Greek Wars in uh, you know, the 300s. And just were like, this is all pretty awesome stuff. We're just gonna take this back with us. So if you notice like the, uh, the Roman Pantheon, for example, you may notice that the Greek Pantheon, just with different names, right? Is the same, the architecture is very, very sim like identical basically. Um, and of course, when uh, Augustus is trying to solidify the Imperium, he wants a great mythic tale that connects the Greek world which would be over here for you guys, I realize, the Greek world to the Italian world. And uh, several of you said you were familiar with the Aeneid, right? And so he connects these two things. And so, um, unsurprisingly, we find a lot of the same themes repeating themselves here. So that was Aristotle. For Cicero, I'll put Plato over there. For Cicero, let's see, for Cicero, we just have kingship. And he didn't view any of these as being deviant. Unlike Aristotle, he didn't view kingship as natural, and then there was some other thing called tyranny, which was unnatural. He believed that there could be a tyranny of the majority, a tyranny of the few, and a tyranny of one. He simply viewed kings as good and bad. There could be kings who looked out for the public good, and there could be kings that did not look out for the public good. And if a king didn't look out for the public good, it was very likely that the king was going to be supplanted by the aristocracy. Which of course is what happened in Rome itself, right? We had the bad Tarquinius Superbus, right? Who was overthrown by the aristocracy. And for a long time, the aristocracy rule well and wisely, but eventually they become oligarchic in their tendencies, not looking out for the public good. And so democracy occurs. But democracy is very difficult to hold together. Very difficult to hold together. And eventually, it will produce either a return of aristocracy or it will produce a king. So kingship, um, I'll just put a line here. Kingship, uh, air 
aristocracy and democracy. Okay, oh, I got the play up here still. Let me give you a passage here real quick while I'm while I'm writing this up here. So. <clears throat> Yes. So, I know all their page numbers are different, but the actual book number here, I am looking at 28, 29, and 30, which was right near where you just were on 31, I believe. Yeah, I was looking on 30. Mm -hmm. So, 29, 28, 27, did you say? Yep, I'm right here on. Th uh, it's on my page, what I'm looking at is book 28, uh, chapter 28, uh, 29, 30. Each regime, according to Cicero, is subject to its own faults. Every one of them lies upon a slippery and precipitous path leading to a certain depravity. So what he's saying here is that, look, any one of these, narrow is the righteous path. Narrow is the pursuit of the public good. People are naturally very easily corrupted. And this is why philosophy and the study of right and wrong and of, uh, and of knowledge, episteme, is so important. Because again, following Aristotle, Cicero believes human beings to be naturally political animals. To have society is natural for us and good. And that through the pursuit of virtue, we can recognize the greatest society with the greatest amount of public good and freedom for all. So, um, right here though, he talks about what, what do we need? Well, discord arises in each of these from conflicting interests. Conflicting interests. One thing that we need to do here is that make sure there is equality before the law. Because it is natural that different elements of society will have conflicts of interest. For example, um, you are a merchant. You are a farmer. You don't want him going and sailing off to some faraway place and bringing back some olives that are going to compete with your olives, right? So we have a conflict of interest here. And it's fine, so long as you don't go to your fellow farmers and say, hey, let's, uh, let's petition to pass a law to make it illegal to bring olives into the town, right? You can't, you can't weaponize the law to undermine his ability to earn a living, right? Same with you. You can't, uh, you know, go, uh, you know, bribe uh, some public official to uh, go inspect his land and be like, yeah, there's uh, all sorts of uh, health code violations here. We're gonna, have to, we're gonna have to rip these olive trees up, you know? Can't do that kind of stuff. Have to have respect for the law. And that sounds like an easy thing to do. Except when we think about the fact that the Constitution, I remember someone said this, uh, I don't remember, it was in some public debate I was at, and there was like a sharp intake of breath when the guy said it. When it to me, it just seemed like the most obvious statement of fact in the world. He said, but the Constitution is just a piece of paper. <gasps> How dare you say that? No, it's not. It's a magical piece of glue that holds this country together. What he was saying is, look, the Constitution was meant to be a set of rights and prohibitions against what the government could do. But that you must have the self-restraint, the virtue, to not try and circumvent these rules, right? Because it's very natural. As soon as a rule gets made, there's always going to be people looking to circumvent this rule, right? To stay maybe just from a letter of law. Oh, maybe it says this. Maybe we read it this way, right? And right away. Of course, right away. This is one of the first great constitutional debates of the early American Republic, which I can't wait till we get to that stuff. Can't wait to talk about that stuff. But the, the debate between Jefferson and Hamilton, where Jefferson is saying, no, if it doesn't say it right here, then it's a no. And Hamilton is even like, but it's kind of implied, isn't it? Like, if it says this, doesn't it also kind of mean this? Until you have like a Department of Education and FBI and all these other sorts of things, right? And an income tax. Like, what the heck? 
<laughs> all these different things. So not to tip my hand too much, I am a for, no, I believe that uh, professors should just be very forthright with their biases so that you know that I am not some kind of, you know, neutral arbiter. There is no such thing. Like I'm trying to teach you material, but yes, I do have a, a political perspective, which I think you all know. Yeah, shock and awe, right? Yes. Did they literally have to amend an income tax though? They did. The they did have to pass it. They did have to pass it. But that was that on like a... But it was sold. It was sold as this. They said, look, guys, we got to get the super rich to pay their fair share. The income tax is only for the millionaires, okay? It's only for the millionaires. And for a time it was. And because I was a millionaire, I said no. And then they came for those with several hundreds of thousands of dollars. I did not have several hundreds of thousands. And so I did nothing. That is a, uh, a reference to what we were talking about earlier. For those of you watching later who are like, what is he talking about? Okay, so. Um, yes, I received several emails recently of people who were like, oh, I love watching your lectures. I'm like, so are you? <laughs> I just put these up for my students in case they decide to sleep in, take a nice afternoon nap. Okay, Plato. Yes, Plato. Okay, yes, so the rule of law, which is something Aristotle said as well. And of course, this all goes back to moderation. Moderation, and this is why we said that Aristotle, pragmatist, right? He's a pragmatist. He's just saying, look, going all around, all of these can work variously well. You, know, you need to have the rule of law. You need to be moderate. And in that, we can hear Cicero. But he's saying, look, there really isn't an ideal. There's really not. Plato, who I still haven't written up here, I'm terribly sorry, I'll pause for just a moment uh, to write this up here right now. Here we have the philosopher king, which is sort of an ideal state philosopher king, aristocracy, democracy, oligarchy, uh, democracy, tyranny, yeah, famous. Plato, he was an idealist. He was saying, look, the, we have an ideal society that we have. It's, 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 it's a normative perspective. It's never gonna actually exist, I know that, but we can try and get close. Cicero, though, in this work, he's saying, we had it, guys. We had it, it was glorious, we lost it, and we're not worthy of our fathers who gave it to us. The Roman Republic, the high Roman Republic, the one that defeated Carthage in the Punic Wars. He's saying that, that was it. He's saying we had, we had, our, we had our two consuls. Which one was the consuls? What were the consuls? Who remembers? Who were the consuls in this system? They're the executives. They're like the president. Imagine if we had two presidents, right? And the idea was they had all the authority of a king to execute foreign policy, which was most of what they did. They fought war all the time. And then you had the Senate, which was kind of like your legislature. And then you had your tribunate, which was your democracy. So if you want to think of uh, tribunate, if you want to think of this as like the House, the House of Representatives, and this as the Senate, obviously, hence the name. Yes. So you're saying the consul is more like a cabinet, right? Kind of like a cabinet, right? Like executing uh, policies given to them from the executive branch in that kind of way? Like executing policy given to them under law. So under the law, they were they were granted, they, they couldn't violate the laws that were written down, which we talked about last time. There were a whole bunch of laws that were written down on the 12 tables. So there were courts that were charged with upholding the law. There were courts that were charged with upholding the law. What their, what their main job, the council's, the council's main job was leading military expedition. It was seen as a great honor to be the first citizen, that's what you were seeing, you were like the first citizens for that year, and the years were named after you. So, um, you know, the, the year would literally, they would say, uh, it happened in the year of, and then they'd name the two guys who were consul for that year. So like, it was like a, in, the, in the record books, you know, brought great glory to the family. They were a, a very, um, uh, they were an intensely, uh, honor-oriented society the, the republic was like to go and die and like for the republic like was you know a great honor and for glory and whatnot at, at least during this but at least that's what uh, the historians and people like cicero would have us believe probably 
there were more or less, you know, there were scallywags in every age, right? But we tend to view the past through uh, rose-tinted glasses, as they say. But Cicero is certainly doing that here. He's saying the moderate form of government would be best. Uh, same with Aristotle, he said, look, we need moderation. And he's saying, look, we had, we had moderation here. He's saying we had moderation here. We had a concern for the public good, res publica. This, everyone was willing to sacrifice whatever it took to serve the state, to see it secure, to see it prosperous, to see it great. Not before we got too much democracy, too much. The tribunate became too powerful, it was expanded, and there was too much democracy, too much demos. The Senate became corrupt, too much oligarchy, greed, lack of care for the public good. And the consuls, too much vanity, democracy, right? Obsession with glory. And this is what I should mention here. There was sort of an inbuilt conflict of interest. If you study behavioral economics in graduate school, there's a lot uh, of psychology that goes into it. For example, one of the famous experiments that they've done is they've said, how can we get more people to be organ donors? It just doesn't make sense. Why won't people donate their organs? They're already freaking dead. And all you have to do is check this box, right? But nobody checks the box. Like 10% of people check the box. So what they did is they ran an experiment. They said, why don't we just have everyone automatically enrolled as an organ donor? And then instead of checking a box to be an organ donor, you check a box that says, I don't want to be an organ donor. And all of a sudden, like 60% of people were organ donors. It was, just, it was just a matter of just how the preference had been laid out. Nothing had changed. You were still free to choose to do it or not. Same thing here. The problem with the consul was that it was your opportunity to go win honor and glory, but you might never get another chance, right? You gotta like the consul. You have to imagine there are you know, hundreds, maybe several hundred, maybe a thousand you know, by the later Republic. You might never be consul again in your life. And like, this was your chance to lead the empire to glory and uh, you know, gain more land and bring more wealth into the city. And they do these huge parades for you when you got back and stuff. And so what you find if you study Roman history is that their foreign policy tended to be a little belligerent, frankly, you know, uh, their, their diplomacy was basically like, send an envoy to those guys over there and tell them if they don't do what we said, we're going to come knock their heads in. And you know, the, the envoy would go and come back and be like, well, they said they didn't want to do that. And it was like, well, they've had their chance, you know, raise the legions. And then they'd go, you know, beat up on them. And you know, then you get your parade and bring back your trophies and rewards and stuff in the name of what? The state? No, not really. Right. In the name of glorifying yourself. And your family, enhancing your own standing, not being moderate, right? We talk about Aristotle's belief that a true republic, the race publica, the public thing, could only be sustained in a very, very small, very, very small circumstance. That once it grew very, very large, you couldn't have a public thing anymore. And that you eventually would have to be ruled by a tyrant. So, um, the cycle. The cycle. We talked about how Aristotle didn't really believe that there was like a cyclical process. Plato, you'll recall, did believe that there was a process, right? Where these two ideal forms, which was essentially ruled by the wise, ruled by those with episteme, those with knowledge, specifically those with knowledge of philosophy, because philosophy is how, in Plato's view, we saw the true world from what were simply the shadows, right? Democracy devolves into democracy, that is, those who gain great glory for themselves. You have to imagine, the citizens, the citizen body here, even when it's not a democracy, you are still catering to public opinion, right? You are still trying to enhance your standing. Um, and whose standing is going to be enhanced? Well, those who bring the greatest glory and gains to the state. From there, so instead of it being honor and glory, being the orientation glory. <laughs> Glory will get glory because there was a lot of stabbing going on, a lot of pointed weapons and stabbing. Oligarchy is what it went devolved into because with all this honor and glory that was coming in, when you make conquest, what comes pouring into the state? Riches. Riches come pouring into the state. And the society's orientation becomes toward money. 
and this is what gives rise to oligarchy. And from there, we get democracy, because what happens here is, uh, and this, this is very interesting, and this is something that I had mentioned, I think, in the first lecture, that there is a certain school of um, intellectuals who believe that basically we just need to study the ancients. That if you just study the ancients, you, you basically have everything you need. Because human beings are very narrow creatures, we're very particular creatures, and we just kind of repeat the same patterns of behavior. And, like our technology changes, but really, I mean, look at the forms of government that we're talking about here. You know, republics, democracies, kingship, like this is basically what we're going to be talking about for the entire rest of the semester, right? Um, we're talking about greed, we're talking about the pursuit of glory, fame, like man, this is just how human, and the difficulty of being virtuous, the difficulty of trying to think about others and the well-being of others to be moderate and to restrain our impulses, right? Like this is all um, very familiar to us, right? So, um, the democracy, oh yes, yes. Um, so what I was saying with that is, we're going to eventually get to a point where there are gonna be what's called the democratic revolutions, uh, starting with the French Revolution. The American Revolution is kind of like that, but it's, it's less clear. The, the revolutions in Europe are going to be very much this way. You know what the American example works too. I'm gonna to stick with the American example too. What you have is riches creating a class, a, an upper middle class, who have lots of wealth, but they have no actual political power. But the state needs that wealth to go carry out things like military activities. And so what happens, sometimes with bloodshed, sometimes with not, is what you have, you have an expansion of the franchise to allow uh, you know, the, the middle class into the, the decision-making body, right? And from there, it's a very short jump, jump to pretty much everyone getting the vote. And from here, we have the rule, simple majority, rule by majority. And of course, in Plato's view, the mob was very easily influenced by promises of great glory and riches, and it wouldn't be long before they just hoisted a tyrant upon themselves, right? And again, he's very much influenced here by uh, the way the assembly, the Democratic Assembly of Athens, was very easily swayed by promises of this and that. You remember the Sicilian expedition that I brought up several times, where pretty much everyone was saying, no, well, I shouldn't say everyone, a lot of the other military leaders and aristocrats were saying, no, that's, that's a dumb idea. We shouldn't do that. It's not going to work. It's super risky. But of course, the one guy was like, ah, you know, listen to those naysayers, bunch of losers, just losers all over the place. Trust me, look at me, I'm rich, I'm successful, I'm strong. Trust me, I'll go win this war for us. And the people were like, that does sound a lot better than what those other guys were saying, you know? And of course he goes off and screws everything up. And uh, of course, this is ultimately what is going to be uh, produced uh, in the Roman example as well. Uh, sorry to Caesar, who I have no particular uh, like or dislike of, but he was certainly one who played upon the the masses, right? Plato was very concerned about democracy. He didn't believe that, demo unlike Aristotle, who said, yeah, democracy can be okay. Remember, Plato is the guy who says, look, there's almost no chance that democracy would ever be a good idea because episteme, knowledge, virtue, these are hard to achieve. Necessarily then, only a few can have them. And so if the many are ruling, the few with virtue will simply be outvoted and we're screwed. That simple. Aristotle, remember, Aristotle was saying, look, as long as we engage in moderation, this can all work out. As long as everyone is trying to be virtuous, living in moderation, this can all be okay. He wanted a balanced government. He said the best government would be the one that combined all of this, right? And following on him, Cicero is saying, oh, baby, we had it, and it was glorious. And he's saying, we should hold on to the Republic. We can save the Republic. Um, if you remember, he was invited to join um, Caesar's cabal uh, with Crassus and Pompey. He declines. Um, he is a true Republican. He believes in, in the Republic. Um, but he is only one guy and fairly idealistic. And the forces of, of his society and history were very much pulling in the other direction. Um, so, do, do, do. yes, moderation, middle way. The Roman Republic, yes. Okay, so. Okay, the last one. 
35 here. Right? 35, 45? Yep. Okay. So, 45. In the conclusion here, he's asking, okay, so look, you've gone through all the pros and cons of each, and just really quickly, I, I want to highlight these again. Kingship, the big draw of kingship is that it is, it is uh, in accordance with nature. In accordance with nature, our nature. Specifically, it mirrors the family. It mirrors the family. It mirrors the family. Which just remind you, following Aristotle, this is the, the core of all life. All political life starts with the family and grows out from there. Aristocracy, he says, look, aristocracy, you get all of the potential uh, wisdom of your society here. Um, you can bet out any bad decisions. You don't have to worry about a possible bad king coming along. That's his, that's his big complaint with kingship, is that even though you have a good king, that's really his only critique of kingship, really, is that it's more likely to wind up with someone who's going to abuse their power simply because there's only one of them, and then when they die, it's just whoever his kid has. And uh, as we saw, who was Marcus Aurelius' son? Who's seen Gladiator? No? No? Oh! All right. Next class period, everyone. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Gladiator. Oh, it's, it's a pretty solid movie. Um, no, uh, Marcus Aurelius' son is called Commodus. Commodus. And virtually every narrative of the Roman Empire basically is like, oh, it was all going great, and then Commodus came along and ruined it all. And he was just a totally awful, awful guy. But basically, you had this super virtuous guy who everyone holds up as like, hey, that was the philosopher king. He raises a son who's just absolutely terrible, just dreadful. Um, so that's his big criticism of kingship. Aristocracy, you get uh, the rule of the wise and necessarily virtuous and moderate. That these are the people who are able to restrain their impulses. If they weren't able to restrain their impulses, they wouldn't be rich, right? They'd be dissolute. They'd have spent all of their wealth. Instead, they were thrifty and wise and had accumulated much property. And these are the ones who are also able to send their children to study under tutors, like Aristotle, for example. So these are these are Ideally, for, for someone like Aristotle, he feels most comfortable with the aristocracy. Probably so Plato, too, because the philosopher king is simply an ideal state. But Cicero warns that, look, just like any other group, even though this is your wise, moderate portion of society, he says they are still a faction. And just like any faction, they can start thinking more about themselves than about the public good. So he says you can't necessarily trust the aristocracy. And then democracy. Democracy... Quality and freedom he says this is the best. Unfortunately, democracy also uh, is very easy to uh, erode because it is again harkening back to Plato. Very difficult to live virtuously. It's one of the reasons that Cicero writes a lot elsewhere on the importance of education, on the importance of public education, because he attributes the decline of the Roman Republic to bad virtue among the population, to a lack of virtue. And he blames this on education. And so he, again, he spends a lot of time writing about the, the necessary education. And this is something that uh, Adams, Adams of the American uh, system, will spend a lot of time writing about the necessity of establishing proper curriculum in schools to inculcate Republican virtue, by which he means uh, sort of a very uh, you know, most of you are Protestants, I say, you know, that very healthy, Protestant, thriving, you know, uh, business-like, you know, go to bed early, early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise, right? The Benjamin Franklin quip, which of course is ironic because that is not how Benjamin Franklin lived his own life. Um, I digress. Not to slander, uh, I guess it wouldn't be slander, it's true. Not to uh, impugn his character. Um, yes. He talks about this danger of democracy here. An excess of liberty turns into an excess of servitude, meaning that by just being free to follow their own passions and whims, very soon you have a population that can't even take care of itself and that they will necessarily incline towards 
a strong ruler to take care of them. Or I'll, I'll, I'll just read what I have here about uh, his, his theory of, of cyclical political change here, because it's slightly different from Plato, but you can hear echoes of it here. So I wrote this out so that I can make sure I got it right. Cicero believed that political societies evolved through various forms of government, just as both Plato and Aristotle had begun to describe. So his cyclical theory of political evolution, which he, he presents in book four, in full, um, you have monarchy, aristocracy, and democracy. They rise and fall in natural progression. Each regime has its strengths and weaknesses, as we talked about, but each is vulnerable to corruption, leading it to decline. So we had monarchy. We begin with a single virtuous ruler, and this risks degenerating into tyranny. Into tyranny. So don't get confused here where you have like a king in tyranny. Like it's the Plato thing is different. I will put all of this on a slide specifically before our review for the final exam. Because there, there are going to be questions on this specific stuff, like who thought what thing, right? And so I want to make sure that we uh, we aren't confused there about which is which. So because for um, it's, there are similarities because Cicero believed that if the kingship degenerated into tyranny, then an aristocracy would rise to overthrow it, and this is kind of similar to what he believed, right? He said that eventually the tyranny would be overthrown by an aristocracy. So there are, again, there are similarities here. Um, and of course, uh, the, the, the ruler who turned to tyranny in the case of the Roman Republic was uh, uh, Tarquinius Superbus. He was overthrown by the, the, um, the aristocracy. Um, we already talked about the best things about aristocracy. He also believed it appealed to our appreciation for beauty, our natural appreciation and longing for beauty, that, that uh, you know, kingship with all of its regal trappings and ceremonies and stuff uh, just sort of appealed to, to, our, to our love of beauty. Aristocracy, small group of wise, virtuous leaders. The danger here is, of course, oligarchy, where they start to govern for their own benefit rather than the benefit of the many, of the, of the, of the public, the public good. The best thing about aristocracy, as we said, was moderation. And if it became oligarchical, it would be overthrown by the people, and a democracy would take its place. So we've moved from kingship, there's a good king, there's another good king, there's another good king, it's all great because they're all looking out for the public good. Oh, but then we get a bad king. The aristocracy takes over, and we get lots of good aristocrats for several generations. Oh, but then their great-great-grandkids are a bunch of self-centered brats who abuse the system. Boom, they get overthrown. Democracy now. For a while, the democracy for a while, the democracy, representing the will of the people and taking care of the public good, it devolves into basically mob rule. Once that happens, neglectful of maintaining the virtue necessary for self-government, it will ultimately revert to either aristocracy or kingship. So basically, we, we jump back up here. So it comes down and then jumps back up to one of these two. And then if, if it's aristocracy, and it degenerates, it will go back to democracy, aristocracy, uh, you know, if it's kingship, and there's good kings, they will stay for a while, if there's bad king, and so it just keeps going like this, just jumping back and forth. So, um, yes, and, there, and uh, it can, so what he calls this here, he doesn't, he doesn't call it tyranny when the democracy raises up an individual to take care of them. It is essentially what, what, what is anachronistically called Caesarism. Julius Caesar presented himself as the people's man against the oligarchs. Julius Caesar basically came to the dispossessed Roman people. We talked about how they had been dispossessed, how there was great wealth and equality within the society, particularly among uh, veterans, right, in the cities, whose land had been seized while they were out on campaign. Julius Caesar comes to them and says, look, the people in power, the rich people, the bureaucrats, all that stuff, they're, they're, they're just going to oppress you. They're abusing the system. They're taking advantage of you. And they hate me because I am defending you and want to take care of your interests. And if only you will follow me and empower me, we can defeat them and sweep them into the dustbin of history, and I will lead you to the just rewards that you all deserve. 
this is something that uh, there's, a, there's a book that was written in the 19th century that basically draws the same parallels and finds the same sort of dynamics present in the rise of the nephew of Napoleon, the first Napoleon, Napoleon the Great, his nephew, Napoleon III, will also become emperor of France about 35, 40 years after his uncle's second exile. And it'll be kind of the same thing. Uh, he'll basically say to the people, look, you know, they're, you're being taken advantage of and abused. And, and of course, it's, it's very funny because both Caesar and Napoleon were themselves men of means, right? They were men of that class. But they were able to go down to the people and get them to follow them and to place their will in him and to make them believe that I am your will manifest. And that I will sweep away all of the, of the things that are, un, that, are, that are unjust, that are oppressing you. And that you'll live much better under me. And so again, it's not tyranny. It's not a tyranny. It is someone who they elect, basically, to take care of them. It is not uh, someone who is being imposed upon them by force, I guess would be the, the difference there. Um, and theoretically, the aristocracy could elevate one of their number to the king, to the kingship, <coughs> if they were of incredible moral character. The example that Cicero uses is um, uh, Cyrus the Great. Cyrus the Great. We didn't talk about the, the Persian Empire, but there were several great rulers. One of them was Darius, Darius III, I think it was, uh, Cyrus the Great. And so he uses them as examples where, you know, if a man of, of such great virtue and character were among the aristocracy, you know, perhaps they would elevate him to rule as king. So that's it. That's, uh, that is Cicero. There are a lot, I know there are a lot of similarities between Plato, between Aristotle, and between Cicero. And in part, it's because, um, you know, they are, well, in this case, we had a direct uh, student-teacher relationship. And in the case of Cicero, Cicero had gone and been a student, essentially, of Aristotle's students. Much later students. They were separated by a couple of hundred years. But So that is why there are such similarities. But this stuff here is going to be highly influential because uh, the Roman Empire, spoiler alert, next week we're going to destroy it when we introduce Augustine. And we're going to get really into Christianity, apropos, for the next couple weeks because we're going to do Augustine and Aquinas. But we're also going to introduce some of the political structures of neighbors, specifically those northern barbarians who are always banging on Rome's doors trying to get in. We're going to look at things like Germanic tribal structures and see how these were fused with existing Roman practice to eventually produce things like the Kingdom of the Franks. Charlemagne, anybody? Yeah. And these are what are eventually going to grow into the modern states of, well, in the case of the Franks, France, right? And that's how it's going to connect to the modern period. So, any questions for today? Okay, I will get the discussion board up tonight as per last week, and I will leave it open until Sunday at midnight. Okay. Thank you all for being here today. All right, I'm going to erase this for my fellow who follows. I have a set of pink ones and a set of green ones. So there's going to be, I think it's pink on my closet. Have a good rest of your day. Hey, thank you, you as well. Thanks. Try and stick your pillow up here, guys. We'll try that. So we're going to kind of curtain it off so like it's a little like, kind of like our own rooms. You know, and yeah, and we also did a sheer curtain instead of like a curtain curtain, just so like it did make the space feel too small. So like you're like sleeping? Yeah. So it's